All I know is this, once I was blind, and now I see. This is the text that appears on screen at the end of Raging Bull, one of Scorsese's most critically acclaimed films. Raging Bull is the story of boxer Jake LaMotta, an angry, oh, you're supposed to be a manager. You're supposed to know what you're doing. jealous, what are we talking to sound for? an abusive man whose behavior alienates him from the people around him. The choice to leave the audience with these lines from the Christian Bible is, at first glance, a puzzling one. Lamada has no conversion experience, the film contains religious imagery, but Lamada never once goes near a church and there's almost no talk of God or anything religious in the film. It's a story about a man who behaves badly and whose life disintegrates around him. So why does Scorsese choose to end the film with a verse from scripture about redemption? This video is sponsored by Mubi. But Christ did not die for the good and beautiful. That is easy enough. The hard thing is to die for the miserable and corrupt. Cheers. The Wolf of Wall Street spends an extended sequence focused on a debaucherous escapade in which Jordan Belfort accidentally overdoses on quaaludes to pretty hilarious effect. This happens to be one of the milder of the film's depictions of the profane or the behaviors of humans that we typically consider to run counter to the virtues and values taught by religion. Three years after this scene, Scorsese would say he was making his next film silent to get to know Jesus better. And as I prepare to do his work, I see his face before me. I'm talking about this. <laughs> Few directors have devoted as much screen time to violent, despicable, profane characters as Martin Scorsese. From Taxi Driver's Travis Bickle to Henry Hill and Goodfellas, Wolf of Wall Street's Jordan Belfort, or The Irishman's Frank Sheeran, Scorsese's best-known films are ones that showcase characters who are remorselessly violent, corrupt, self-seeking, abusive, or who continually betray the people around them. And yet, in 2016, with his film Silence, Scorsese made one of the most thoughtful, sincere explorations of Christian faith in the last decade, with the Pope saying he hopes it bears good fruit. And so you might think with Silence that Scorsese was turning from his old, profane ways back to religion, but Silence was far from the first time Scorsese made a film explicitly exploring spiritual subject matter. Oh, forgive them. The Last Temptation of Christ in 1988 directly explored the life of Jesus, and 11 years after that, Scorsese told the story of the Dalai Lama in Kundu. While these three explicitly spiritual films have never been his most popular work, I think understanding the themes at their core and the role Christianity has played in Scorsese's own life is crucial to understanding central themes that are present in all of his films, and the perspective from which he approaches even his most profane characters and stories. As far back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. In Goodfellas, Henry Hill has no aspirations of being a saint. He ventures into a life of violence, drugs, and corruption. He's gonna be working together. Not hesitantly, but joyfully. <laughs> he wears a cross, but this seems to be at best a symbolic nod to the divine. No element of his life seems to reflect the virtue and self-sacrifice it represents. This life of crime does eventually catch up with him. And we find Henry's life, the one we've just seen play out in the film, under scrutiny in a courtroom. In this moment, we see the central religious theme that is present in almost all Scorsese's films, judgment and redemption. For a long period of time, I was fascinated by uh, stories of the missionaries. Scorsese was raised Catholic. Uh, when I was about eight or nine, ten years old and I wanted to become a married old missionary. Obviously, we now know that he would eventually abandon those hopes and be drawn into cinema. Lord, I'm not worthy to eat your flesh, not worthy to drink your blood. Not worthy to drink your blood. Scorsese's third feature, but the most well-known of his early films, Mean Streets, follows the character of Charlie in the streets of New York. Charlie is a low-level criminal, but Charlie is also obsessed with his spiritual status. He has a strong sense that he will be judged for his sins. And it's all bullshit except the pain, right? The pain of hell. The birth from a lighted match increased a million times. On the streets, Charlie acts out the role of a priest. He jokingly quotes scripture. Let me ask you something. Wow. I thought we came with juice. 
Dost thou say this of thyself, or have others told thee me? And gives out blessings. Well, St. Charles is here. Everybody, benediction. But more symbolically, he also tries to act as a mediator between Johnny, a lowlife who is constantly racking up debts, and his other friend Michael, who is constantly asking for those debts to be repaid. Don't you think you ought to care a little more about Johnny's payments than me? I think you should, you know. Michael, Michael, nobody's out to screw you. I guarantee that. Johnny owes a debt to Michael, and if this debt isn't repaid, the result will be violent judgment. This is a street-level reflection of the spiritual position that Charlie finds himself in. Within the structure of the church, he owes a debt to God for his sins, and if he cannot repay that debt, the result will be violence in hell. Like Charlie between Johnny and Michael, the church and priests act as a mediator between Charlie, taking confessions for his sins, and the judgment of God. But while Charlie confesses, he refuses to do what the priest tells him to do. Now that may be okay for the others, but it just doesn't work for me. I mean, if I do something wrong, I just want to pay for it my way. So I do my own penance for my own sins. What do you say, huh? Besides, I don't like loaded crates. I tell you, you're not supposed to like it. Johnny is also indignant and refuses to do the work required to pay off his debts. And when Michael comes knocking, Charlie, like a priest, or perhaps even as a symbol of Christ himself, attempts to negotiate on Johnny's behalf for those debts to be forgiven. From the church's perspective, Charlie is like Johnny. He refuses to do the work necessary to pay his moral debts. Ultimately, despite Charlie's attempts, he is unable to delay Michael's judgment forever. If for Johnny, who doesn't do what his priest Charlie tells him to do, judgment on the streets comes calling, will eternal judgment come calling for Charlie, who also refuses to do what his priest tells him to do? The film's ending implies a question. What is required to be forgiven? I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying. Mean Streets has a lot of autobiographical elements, and I think we see reflected in the film Scorsese's own grappling with his movement away from the calling of the church and towards the more profane world of the streets. We know now that while Scorsese would eventually consider himself a lapsed Catholic, his concern for his spiritual status would never leave him. Is the film blasphemy or an affirmation of faith? We were just wondering what wrong you feel that Hollywood's committed by making this film. They've offended millions of Christians all over the world. Many of the protesters circling the front of the opera house, while those with tickets who'd ignored the advice of the Bishop of Cork not to attend, queued for admission. We're very indignant that they would come up with such a profane well, what's profane about it? I haven't seen Have you seen the movie? Well, it's... Uh, Why are you picking this movie here? Because I think it's disgraceful what they're trying to do to our Lord. The Last Temptation of Christ was not well received by religious groups or institutions. One group in France even going so far as to torch a theater where it was being screened. Scorsese's own Catholic Church declared it morally offensive. The controversy centered around this. Scorsese and writer Paul Schrader, a Protestant Calvinist, wanted to use the life of Christ as a metaphor for exploring a human struggle between the sacred and the profane. The crux of the story is that Jesus, rather than being coolly confident in his position as fully God as he is in most depictions, struggles deeply as someone who is fully man with his divinity. How could I be the Messiah? When those people were torturing Magdalene, I wanted to kill them. And then I opened my mouth, and out comes the word love. Why? I don't understand. And on the cross faces a last temptation of stepping down and being just a man. The focus on Christ as fully man makes the struggle of Christ very relatable, but for the religious who have a deep veneration for the image of Christ, the extent to which Scorsese visualized Christ's temptation was an impossible pill to swallow. Anybody who mocks the crucifixion will burn in hell. The fact that many religious groups found reason to be offended is not surprising. The film itself is a direct attack on biblical or Orthodox Christianity. What is perhaps more surprising is the level of sincerity with which Scorsese himself was approaching the film. Looking past how the film was received by religious groups, The Last Temptation of Christ was not on Scorsese's part an attempt to denigrate or critique Christ as God, but actually an attempt to try to better understand the figure of Christ, faith, and religion. Leading up to and following its release, Scorsese defended the film's spiritual value. But years later, in the director's commentary for the Criterion edition, he would make some interesting comments about its success in exploring these themes. In this particular film, by directing his picture, dealing with the iconography head-on, 
and dealing with the themes head on may not have been as successful as dealing with those themes in Mean Streets and Raging Bull where time places it in a different context. But it's still the same theme, you see. That Scorsese sees Mean Streets and Raging Bull as ultimately more successful explorations of the same spiritual ideas reveals just how significant the spiritual core of those films are. Charlie's struggle in Mean Streets and Christ's struggle in The Last Temptation are essentially the same. Both grapple with a divine calling and the allure of the profane world, just as Scorsese himself did. In The Last Temptation, Scorsese attempted to bring humanity and the profane reality of the streets he grew up on into the religious story of Christ. In Mean Streets, Scorsese brings the religious story of Christ into the profanity of the streets. We don't make religion something that's foreign, that's separate from life. That's the key. Like it says in Galatians 3, have you suffered so many things in vain? Cape Fear gives us yet another of Scorsese's moral quandaries. Sam Bowden, a defense attorney, intentionally botches a defense in order to let his client receive a harsher sentence. I mean, why me? Look, I was your lawyer. I defended you. A result he believed and we, the audience, don't have much difficulty believing was completely justified. 14 years later, his client, Max Cady, is released from prison and returns seeing himself as enacting God's judgment on his lawyer for not fulfilling his duty to defend his client. I am like God and God like me. It's an over-the-top, complicated, and kind of difficult movie to watch, but there's an important moment towards the end that I want to highlight. Katie invokes a sort of makeshift courtroom. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I agree. That was argument. And when he looks towards the judge, he looks towards the sky as if he's looking to God. I can't ask any questions, Your Honor. He is a hostile witness. And he also looks directly at us. I think this gives us a clue to how Scorsese is wanting his audience to approach his films. Katie is asking God to act as a judge, and Scorsese is asking us to act as a jury. It didn't mean anything. When I was broke, I would go out and rob some more. We ran everything. We paid off cops, we paid off lawyers, we paid off judges. It's not the only Scorsese film to end in a courtroom. The end of Goodfellas recontextualizes the entire film as a confession. We're the jury hearing Henry Hill's testimony, and now we must come up with a verdict. This maneuver of asking the audience to act as a judge or jury is most explicit in these films, but it's implied in almost every one of Scorsese's movies. Travis Bickle commits a viciously violent act that he's ultimately praised for by the media, but the audience knows his internal motivation and has to judge him for themselves. In The Departed, which is about an undercover cop, we're asked to wonder, how are you judged when from the outside you look like one of the bad guys? At the end of The Wolf of Wall Street, a film that also acts as a kind of confession, Scorsese asks us to judge Jordan Belfort for his actions and then asks us to judge ourselves for participating in the veneration of his escapades as entertainment. In The Irishman, the silent watching eyes of Frank's daughter Peggy act as a judging watchful gaze. And in Raging Bull, these few lines from scripture recontextualizes the film as a question about whether Jake LaMotta can be redeemed. Somehow he seems to come to some sort of peace with himself. He seems to forgive himself, and maybe that's where we have to begin. On that day, the faithful received fresh hope, and I was renewed. It would take an entire video on its own to unravel all the theological and spiritual themes in silence, so I'm just going to focus on the elements that help us better understand these broader themes of redemption, judgment, and forgiveness that run through most of his films. In silence, Jesuit priests go to Japan in search of another missionary who is rumored to be an apostate, someone who has given up the faith. In Japan, they must operate in secret, and the Japanese government goes to great lengths to shut down any foothold Christianity might be gaining in the country. But the element of the story that Scorsese is most interested in and focused on is the act of apostasy itself. <laughs> of denying Christ symbolically by stepping on the fumie, an image of Christ, and whether this act can be forgiven. Kichijiro repeatedly denies Christ and betrays the priests, but Rodriguez always mediates on his behalf, offering forgiveness. But when Rodriguez himself denies Christ, is there anyone to offer him forgiveness? 
An examination of whether priests stepping on an image of Christ can maintain their faith might seem disconnected from the depiction of the debauchery of Jordan Belfort, or a depiction of the unrelenting betrayal of Frank Sheeran, but I think Scorsese has the same goal in examining both these subjects. Scorsese paints his wrongdoers with a heavy brush. He doesn't give the audience a comfortable remove from his character's violence, hatred, betrayal, or corruption. The profane is often portrayed along with a sense of allure that allows us to see what drew these characters into that life in the first place, but attached to all of it is a question. By asking us to act as a judge, Scorsese is asking us to consider whether these characters can be forgiven and redeemed, a question that seems to haunt not just these films, but Scorsese himself. Do they deserve mercy too? And if they've harmed so many people, you know, well, in Christian idea, they do. How do you do that? I, I find it hard, you know? <laughs> we all do. <laughs> we all do. But this is where Christ is pushing us, see? Maddening, but it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge, and it's, it, it's the right way, I think. Scorsese provokes us to consider the question more deeply by focusing on the gray areas where our personal moral standards come into conflict with the standard of the law or the church. In the eyes of the justice system, Max Cady is technically right. A defense lawyer is legally obligated to defend their client. But what is his moral obligation in our eyes? In Goodfellas, Henry Hill is technically redeemed in the eyes of the law and placed in witness protection. But is he morally redeemed in our eyes? And silence portrays what is technically within the eyes of the church one of the worst wrongs someone can perform, an outward denial of Christ himself. And then it asks the question, will even that wrong be forgiven? Looking at these themes as they sprawl out across his work, we can see Scorsese's own struggle with these ideas play out. Can I live up to it? I don't know. Honestly, don't think so. But what you do is you keep trying. You just keep trying. But whatever answers he's come to on his own, ultimately with his films, he simply asks the questions and leaves the answers to us. In silence, we find a priest who does not appear to be a Christian on the outside, performing none of the actions or rites associated with Christianity, but who supposedly holds a remorse and a faith in his heart, and we're asked, is this enough? Can he be redeemed? In The Irishman, we see the opposite, one of Scorsese's profane gangsters who, at the end of his life, performs the external rites. God, we come before you sinful and sorrowful. Sinful and sorrowful. He says the right words, but internally he seems to have no remorse or true repentance, and we're asked, is this enough? What is required to be redeemed? In America, Martin Scorsese has been one of the loudest voices for international cinema. I share that love, and one of the best places I've found to expose myself to more movies from around the world is my sponsor for today's video, Mubi. Mubi is an online streaming cinema with a focus on discovery and curation. I just started delving into the movies of Indian filmmaker Satyajit Rai, and Mubi just recently added four of his films to their library that I haven't seen, and I can't wait to check them out. I also recently watched the documentary The Hottest August, which follows in the foot steps of some of my favorite documentarians like Chris Marker. I really enjoyed it and I hadn't even heard of it until I found it on Mubi. Every day they add a new title to their huge library of international indie art house and classic films and you can get 30 days of access for free by using my link. Mubi is a great place to discover something new so I definitely recommend giving it a try. Go to mubi.com slash thomasflight that's m-u-b-i dot com slash Thomas Flight. Click the link on the screen or in the description to get your 30 day extended free trial of Mubi. There was a lot I wanted to examine about silence that just wasn't relevant to this video or I didn't have time to get into, but I'm gonna make a bonus video for my $5 and up patrons this month. So if you wanna get access to that, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash Thomas Flight.